Greetings all, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming out to our fine little city for this event. Um, I'm Dan Radvin, I'm one of three preparators uh, here in uh, Santa Fe at Exhibit Central. And uh, what I'm gonna present to you is uh, a method for making necklace mounts that we devised uh, a number of years ago called hot formed acrylic necklace mounts. This project first started, uh, I think it was back in 97, when we had a show in production called Native Couture up at the Museum of Indian Arts. And uh, we had to make many, many, several dozen uh, mounts for... Uh, uh, oh, 2007. <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, it's a time, it's a time warp. Never mind. <laughs> It's so much fun, we never know what time begins and ends. Um, so, many, many mounts. Uh, uh, and the uh, pieces in the show were historic and contemporary. Uh, so, um, it's just another view of the gallery uh, of the finished pieces. So, the scope of the project is that we had to uh, design a consistent method to display a diverse style of uh, necklaces. Um, uh, some were multi-stranded beaded, uh, pendant, heavy silver, multi-element, and even ensemble pieces. Uh, uh, another aspect was it had to be dynamic. Uh, give a warm form to each piece. Um, it also had to be adaptable. It had to be uh, able to deck mount or wall mount and uh, complement the modern aesthetic of the exhibit design. So how? put our brains together, we did a little art uh, research and decided acrylic was going to be the best uh, material for this uh, because of its tra transparency, contemporary uh, vibe, and uh, also to visually float and disappear. So uh, as we all know with mount making, it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, uh, the first ones um, uh, were completely flat. No, it didn't really work. It was, uh, I mean, literally flat. It was nothing much more than uh, pinning a piece uh, to a, a slant. So uh, the second idea, uh, which is pictured, it was to give this flat form, uh, flat shape of uh, some form, um, and use a little uh, necklace, a little chalk at the back uh, so that it had some capture to hold the necklace in place. Uh, it was close, but just didn't quite. The next one, the third version was uh, uh, the, the back of the uh, uh, necklace form was uh, split so that uh, uh, we were able to compress it slightly to gain a little more dimension to the body, uh, uh, which uh, gave it a, the necklace a nice lay. Um, uh, but the flat back didn't provide any capture for the uh, neck area of the necklace, so we st still had to defy gravity a lot, and which required a lot of uh, 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 small pin hooks to hold the piece onto the mount. Uh, but there is always that aha moment um, where clarity is found. Uh, so uh, the biggest change was those uh, the two ends of the uh, back ends of the blank were uh, uh, by twisting and forming them at the same time. It gave a vertical surface to um, gain some capture for the back of the necklace, which really helped in keeping it on the form. Um, and uh, that was that moment. And, and then after I realized it, it was like uh, back in the old days, uh, I made a lot of aluminum jewelry, and I used these kind of complex curving forms. So uh, uh, it was somewhere stuck in the back of the brain where the idea really sat. Uh, so let's uh, make one. We uh, just currently uh, finished up an exhibit up at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture called uh, Turquoise Water Sky, which required us again to display uh, a multitude of uh, uh, necklaces. Uh, and we had a large stock of these necklace mounts from the previous show, but we still had to make several new ones. Uh, so that gave an ample opportunity to uh, document the process. 
So uh, in this particular case, uh, the piece is a silver turquoise squash blossom necklace. It had a heavy pendant in the front, and many, all the little squash blossoms are all articulated and loose in the, the turquoise uh, pieces. Uh, so it, I found with this process that uh, it's really helpful to use a rigid mannequin uh, to work off of uh, for creating the pattern because you can mark on it, tape on it, etc. Um, but uh, in the end, you know, use whatever kind of mannequin you have available to you. Um, if it can be gender or age specific, then it's even all the better because uh, you can make a much more accurate mount that way. Uh, the first part is uh, mapping out the inside and outside perimeter of the piece. Uh, this will be your pattern zone. Uh, then inside that pattern zone, uh, cut and fill it with uh, paper. Uh, you, you know, cut your paper with darts and slits and make up and bits. Doesn't have to be pretty, just you want to try to fit the contour of the mannequin as best as possible. Uh, and then use lots of tape to stick it together. Place the piece uh, back on the mannequin form and trace around it. Uh, note, use a pencil. Uh, I think I used a Sharpie there. <clears throat> uh, uh, once you're done uh, tracing around your piece, uh, cut the uh, pattern loose. Um, when you're pulling it off your mannequin, there's usually lots of undercuts and tape and whatnot, so you got to kind of peel it off real lightly. Uh, then uh, refine your, your pattern a little bit. It out. Uh, this step's not necessary particularly, but uh, you can always check the fit uh, once again. Uh, and then you can also make some decisions before you transfer uh, the pattern to uh, your acrylic, um, you know, what things are necessary or not. In this case, I decided this bottom disc was really going to be needed. Transfer your pattern. Uh, in most cases, you'll find that a flint acrylic is going to be totally suitable. Um, uh, you can use thicker. We've used thicker, and it actually has a really kind of a nice, substantial look to it. Uh, but it's definitely much more difficult to form. Um, and uh, just as a little, what goes on here? Added just a little bit at the end of the legs from where the pattern actually ended. Um, and this will be where these two pieces overlap in the back and uh, will be fastened together with screws later on. Um, but also note that your pattern, when you're looking at it, is probably not going to be symmetrical, especially when you're um, making beaded pieces because they never hang symmetrically. So don't overanalyze it. Just make sure your lines flow real nicely. Because if, if the piece fit, um, if you made a pattern off the piece, it's it's gonna fit it in the end. Um, cut it out. Uh, use a bandsaw, but you know, uh, again, whatever you have handy. Uh, if you have better technology and you have a CNC router or a, um, a water jet, and you're making a bunch of these, you could always import all those patterns into it, nest them real nicely, and make much better use of your material. Because it's a little wasteful. Um, you have all this that gets uh, chopped out. For finishing, uh, uh, clean up all the accessible areas, you know, all your perimeter stuff with a uh, belt sander. Uh, the insides here, uh, half round file, sharp one, will make quick work of it. Um, uh, sanding. Uh, I, I take it down to a 320 finish. Uh, I find that's all you really need as um, a polished edge tends to catch light a lot more, so it actually becomes a little more discreet with that matte edge. And plus, if, in the end, if you see some aspect of it you want to clean up or change, then it's easy to just to blend that little spot back in without having to polish. Um, this was a little helpful tool that um, I've forgotten about that uh, made a new one for this particular piece is just a, a bench pin to stick in uh, um, onto your uh, vise. Uh, and this just helps you know support when you flat if you want to file this edge or these inside edges. Um, and also uh, uh, just filing on 
any of your edges. That if you put this little fence in there, you can clamp to it. Uh, it just frees up your hands and makes things so they're not flopping and wiggling around. Uh, definitely uh, makes a much more efficient use of your, your energies. Uh, this is a, uh, an important one. Before peeling off all the masking from your uh, acrylic, mark what's top. Because uh, once you start heating and bending, you won't know what's what. And especially if your piece is not symmetrical, if you bend it in the wrong direction, you got to start all over again. Uh, what you need, uh, well, <coughs> basic, basic common sense and some tools we all have around. Uh, work in a room with some good ventilation. Uh, you'll need a non-combustible surface. Uh, it's a kiln shelf. Um, leather gloves. Uh, you use, uh, we use these tape welding gloves. They have a really great dexterity to them. Um, hearing protection. If you're using one of these beasts, <laughs> you know they're loud, and this process will, you know, you'll have a heat gun on for a good. 10 to 15 minutes, so this, you don't need that sound blaring in your ears. Um, but if you have the resources, uh, the imagination, or the time, if you can um, rig up an oven of some kind, or have an oven available to you that you can slip your form into um, on a cookie sheet and bring up to that nice specific temperature acrylic likes to bend at, uh, that's even better because then your entire piece um, is all fluid at that same heat and you don't have any cold spots in it. Uh, and, uh, you'll see where that's um, very helpful in that forming process um, if you ever try to make one of these. Uh, hey, look, it's, what's that to say? clips. Uh, this is the initial uh, heating forming. There's probably about three or four minutes of using this heat gun to get this particular piece um, ready to bend. Uh, and and it's, I hadn't made one of these in a while so and of course the one I picked to document has uh, um, kind of a little hard to see in this still but it you know the two different dimensional transitions here, so you have this really heavy area uh, wide, and then it goes down to these narrow, so it's really hard to balance that heat. So uh, this is one of those things where you just have to kind of play around with it and see what works for you. So this is only about a 50 second clip, and you can see where the leather gloves are handy because then you can really handle it and see if the piece is of a flexibility that's going to allow you to bend it, or I should say form it, because you're going in multiple planes. The key is not to overheat it where it'll bubble and leave fingerprints, but just be malleable. You want this initial bend to be as quick and as fluid as possible. It'll save you in the, the tweaking and fine tuning stage. So that's that first part. That was easy. <laughs> Let's uh, see if we can get the second half to play. So here, uh, you can see it pointed out that I added a clip to hold those two ends together. And this is, you know, pick one side, just work your way around the, um, the form, uh, heating and adjusting as needed. It's actually kind of fun to, to mold this stuff. Yes, I am outdated. 
And this was probably like a nine minute clip that I kind of pushed down to around three minutes, so it kind of bounces around a little bit. And you really are stretching and forming it as you go around. It's not just bending in a singular plane, but in both planes. down that edge, this line, trying to see that it's curving and flowing very smoothly. And uh, you can kind of see how wiggly this edge is, because it hasn't been addressed yet, but kind of a nice curve on the opposite edge. Uh, an air gun. Just cool it a little, not drastically. So you don't want to create a temper problem in the, the final piece, make it brittle. The volume of the heat gun is just enough coming off the laptop to let you know that that is going on, but not to, to assault you. This auditorium <laughs> is just a terrible sound. <laughs> My cell phone started ringing, and that's the thing. Don't let distractions just when you get started, take it all the way to the finish. Don't stop and do something else and go, oh, I'll start this later on. Because the whole piece has a warmth to it from the heat, so it's easier to reheat and adjust little areas. back to my presentation. <laughs> Especially in that initial heat, if you, you had more of an oven situation where that entire thing was fluid, you could probably do that entire uh, forming part and finish um, in one phase, not have to keep going back and forth. I had oh, there we go. There we go. Let's see. Let's catch up to it. So you'll know uh, when when you're done forming this that uh, the final uh, mount it it will not probably fit the mannequin that you made it on, and that's really not the point. Um, I've actually found using trying to use the mannequin as a mandrel to form on results in a very awkward looking uh, uh, final piece. So uh, really uh, rely on your eye and do it free form as you were seeing in the video, and and, and using your eye to judge what the curve, um, and what a nice curve is, um, and, and your transitions. I think that's really what's more important in, uh, 
you know, this base thing. So a uh, little fit check. Um, so, uh, and usually uh, adjusting the circumference of the entire mount is about the only one you're going to need to do. Uh, and you can do this by uh, compressing the form and where uh, these overlap back here, uh, then mark it uh, where that final overlap is. That gives you uh, the piece centered well on the mount because uh, then you'll, you'll trim those. So after that was overlapped, trimmed, um, edges were cleaned, uh, dressed out, then it's uh, drilled in a countersunk. Uh, I use uh, little 440 screws, flathead screws. Uh, they are a nice size and you can, they grab the, the tapped acrylic very well. Um, next step is uh, some socket hardware. Um, and this is kind of an adaptation of a process that we've been using a lot lately uh, where we use uh, receivers uh, on our mounts. And by doing this, you can load the object onto the mount outside of the casework and then uh, put the piece on its mount into the case, um, uh, usually on rods that are already installed in the case. So it's, uh, especially with uh, extremely fragile pieces where it's a lot easier to work like this rather than in a case. Um, it's a really great system. Um, so here, uh, locate and uh, where these posts, uh, the sockets are going to be. And, and that's just a, it's a, it's a balance of the aesthetic of where it sits at on the mount and also uh, the center of gravity so that you're not exerting a lot of excess forces on the mount itself. Here it's not very clear, uh, but these are the holes have been drilled and uh, uh, countersunk. Uh, here the hardware is attached. Um, uh, what we're using are uh, these little 832 by 58 long quarter inch round threaded sleeves. Uh, thank you, Mid Master Car, and uh, some uh, 832 by three long nylon screws. Uh, they kind of disappear well into the acrylic. One other little note is uh, we'll, uh, drill about halfway into that sleeve uh, so that uh, the 832 is just a little bit smaller than the 532 rod that um, we use uh, to mount these onto. The posts, uh, we're using a 532 stainless steel rod prevent at the ends here to uh, kind of set the piece at its uh, display angle. And these are things you'll have to fine tune when you actually go to install. You have to tweak it a little bit to, for the, the final list. Um, and in this case, we use stainless steel rod because uh, it uh, matched the tone of the silver pieces it was going with, uh, the aesthetic of the design of the exhibit. And uh, so that saved us some time so we didn't have to like paint out posts and, why not to match casework color? Um, securing the piece to the mount. Um, this is done, uh, we uh, locate and drill um, several small holes uh, for uh, small wire hooks that will be placed uh, to capture the piece. Um, some pieces are going to require more than others. Uh, Gravity is going to point that out to you keep it on the mount. Uh, another factor uh, is also the fragility of the piece that's going on the mount. Some are going to require a little bit more uh, hooks to keep uh, the weight of the piece balanced for uh, longevity so you're not putting unnecessary forces on it. So these are the little hooks. Uh, 032 stainless steel wire. See where they capture in between some of the beads. Um, with the hooks, uh, bend them as you need them on the working end, but leave them long because it really helps uh, by trying to feed those uh, hooks into their little holes while uh, mount, putting the piece onto the mount, and you can cut them off shortly afterwards. Um, this is a, uh, what do you call it, an afterthought. Uh, after I had uh, made the piece, uh, 
you know, I realized that it was actually stranded on a piece of leather cord, and this piece was going to be up for several years in the, the case it was going into. So I added a couple more hooks to help support the overall weight of the piece. So it wasn't just uh, resting on these back hooks. Uh, just some thoughts. Uh, the time that you spend when you're making your blanket, really uh, fine-tuning and refining how the curve is, it's uh, it, to remove any little awkward moments, especially in the forming of it, is really what makes these mounts work well because then uh, there's no excess light catching on bad line or wiggly um, spots or whatnot. That your eye is really drawn to the piece and not the fact that it's on the mount. couple other details. So uh, the point of this mount was actually able to uh, sufficiently su uh, hold the pendant from swinging backwards and beyond the mount. Uh, and uh, you'll find uh, if you use this method that uh, you might make ex other little armatures that attach onto the mount. You can either solve it, weld them on, or uh, little wire mounts that um, screw on or rivet on to support other appendages. Uh, so it works good as a real um, uh, backbone for your mount. Uh, and then other things that help the visual appearance is uh, nice transitions where you're changing dimensions. Uh, you know, don't have it choppy, because uh, again, those are the things your eyes will pick up on. And that's what we don't want. So uh, here's a final shot of the piece installed in the exhibit, um, which is up currently at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. So if you get a chance to uh, tour that museum, uh, you'll see a lot of these mounts uh, in use. There it is. So thanks.